dude, this was a great episode. We uh, touched on a lot with Kansas. Quick Kansas recap. And touched on the next gen car being unveiled. All the cool paint schemes that we uh, got going on this week at Darlington. And of course, all the DraftKings information you need to hopefully win this week. So yeah, we talked about quite a few drivers. This was a uh, this was a, a really good one, but the thing that I'm the most excited about is we're going to be giving these away. And if you want to find out how, just watch the rest of the video. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the DK Garage. I'm Jeremy. And I'm Joe. Joe, how did your Kansas, Kansas lineups fare this past week? It was going great, and that last restart, uh, Kyle Larson got shuffled back, and some of the winnings just kind of vanished. But overall, break even, it was it was fun, entertaining. Um, Kyle Larson really was dominant, wasn't he? We he was one of, I mean, I picked him for the first time in our rundown as a 10, the highest score we give on our DK impact. Um, and he over delivered until the very end. Uh, I mean, when you're the leader late in the race on a track like that, you can't give up the track position. He stayed out. He's on a little bit older tires. Guys behind him had newer tires. Oh, I, I don't want to say quite a sitting duck but pretty dang close um messed up on the second to last restart there got behind a little bit was starting to make it back up but once that uh second or the last caution i should say came out uh it just he was too bunched up behind blaney couldn't get around him tried basically wrecked him and put him in the wall finished 19th um it was a fun race to watch i know there was some long green flag runs um kind of that those are always good get the race over a little bit quicker but sometimes there's not a lot of action but the strategy is always in effect and you don't know who's going to come win and what penalties might come into effect to off off throw off the race i think really that's almost more strategy under green um so people who are kind of privy to nascar you you, you get it but if you're just kind of a casual fan i understand it's you know you want to see some action you want to see those crazy restarts uh, but overall, I thought Kansas was a great race. Um, my lineups were okay, a little less than break even. Larson finishing where he did definitely helped, but I mean, dude, he still had a hundred points. Really dominant. Yeah, he was really dominant, and let's not lose sight of Brad Kozlowski and what he was able to do. He led over seventy laps. He was also in the optimal lineup um, on DraftKings, and he is somebody that you looked at in a stack of drivers that had the or started in the top 10 which one of these guys was going to be the one to have and he jumped out early uh with starting on the pole and he was able to lead quite a bit of lap uh quite a bit of laps before kyle larson caught him finally and once he did it was really his day was over but he still had to maintain a good finishing spot which he did finishing third he did uh he it's when it comes to someone like Brad, it's never that surprising when he performs well. I mean, he's one of the best drivers out there. But I will say he wasn't one of our top picks this previous week. Uh, Larson was definitely one of those guys. There were several guys that we really liked. Kansas was a difficult race. So many guys in good spots. Um, but, yeah, you, you, I mean, you hit it. I mean, Brad was really good, kind of mostly stunk up the first stage. Uh, just couldn't get around him. Looked like Byron had some good runs. Byron was showing a lot of speed, kind of faded, but still came back, got another uh, top 10. Um, he was also really impressive. Um, yeah, just, just overall, it was just a great race. And then finally, finally, your guy, your champion for this year, Got his got his first victory of the season. It's another week, another winner. This is the best season uh, that you can put together is what they advertised, and Kyle Busch hadn't been really on the radar until finally. He came to a race and actually made an optimal lineup and pulled it off. What What's happening? We 
we knew it was kind of about that time that we might see something and finally to see it come uh come at uh, kansas wasn't too surprising to us one of those places we thought if there was a place he could win and get things rolling it, it was at kansas so We'll see if he can kind of build off of this and uh, take the momentum into uh, this next set of races where it's going to be interesting uh, moving forward. I'm excited to see uh, if he's able to harness this. I am too. I think that this is going to be good for the team overall. I mean, obviously you get the win off. You know you're in the playoffs. Now you can just have a different strategy the rest of the season. Uh, even guys uh, that were you know dominant last year like Harvick, they're not in that boat yet. They'll probably make it on points, but – we keep getting new winners maybe they don't so there's still a lot of pressure out there but you know for Kyle Busch and his team uh, the pressure is essentially gone now they just get to have a, a completely different strategy um, but we talked about it a little bit in the podcast and, and even when we kind of conversate ourselves we saw that Kyle Busch has been pretty good this year it's just, he's so easily overlooked because we're so used to him dominant. We're, we're so used to him doing things like what Larson did, where they'll just go out there or even Brad, you know, stink up the show, uh, just be running up front all day, can't get around him. And we haven't seen it in so long, but we knew it was not a matter of, you know, if it was when, and we knew it was getting to that point. And it, sure enough, I mean, he hadn't really done too much this year, but he did have 22 fastest laps and led 20 laps uh, and ran up front or in the top, 10 most of the day yeah it was to your point that it's been a long time coming that we were waiting for him to be in winner's circle but again it wasn't in dominant fashion like we've seen in the past he was there hanging up towards the front all day he didn't really have to fight his car too much he, he felt it felt more like a Kyle Busch confident driving um, on a Sunday afternoon versus what we've typically seen where he's just always pissed off and can't can't find a way to get around the track so it was kind of nice to see them maybe put some pieces together and build build off of that um only time will tell if it's a the the return of kyle bush if we can see some consistency and uh to see if he can't start getting some uh some wins they finally gave him a card that wasn't killed You're right, right. you know <laughs> look what he can do imagine that yeah, so it, um now the only guy left in uh, Joe Gibbs racing without a win is Denny Hamlin, who's for now securely in the points lead for the regular season championship. So uh, Gibbs is looking looking strong, despite not always looking that strong on the track. I mean, you've seen guys like we've already talked about Larson just go out there and been super fast. Um, Brad's look good. Joey's look good. Um, uh, their teammate Blaney has also looked good. Other Hendrick Motorsports cars have looked good. Uh, so I think, in a way, it's a little sneaky for Joe Gibbs Racing, but all of their drivers are going to be in the playoffs. It's it's crazy to think about the only one in that stable that doesn't have a win is Denny Hamlin, and he's been the model of consistency for pretty much the entire season. So without – I ba it, basically, to sum it up, his time will come where he'll win uh, at least one, two, three races out of a handful, and it's – you can't be that consistent in this sport and not win. It's very difficult. So I think we'll see it sooner than later. And literally could come this week. I mean, this is a good place for him, but we will get into the track and Denny Hamlin there in a little bit. Uh, who else kind of stood out to you in this race? It, not surprising, but it was nice to see, and I don't want to talk about him too long because he's not a full-time cup driver, but Austin Sendrick. He was somebody that we knew would be able to come in and, and ha have a top 25 car. He wasn't up at the front all the time, but he didn't get anybody's way. You, they didn't talk about him causing any issues. They did talk about him a couple of times. Uh, I think I saw him as high as 14th or 15th. So he Exactly. He was able to, to get around the track and not uh, cause any issues. And It's nice to see a young driver take, a, take a, an opportunity like that and have a solid finish. He, he had the best PD of anybody. Best place differential out of anybody last week with 16 places gained. Um, and starting 38, sure, he had a uh, handful of cars that weren't the fastest that he had to get around. But ultimately, still, to see somebody with his talent and um, just being able to get out and have that experience and exposure, it doesn't do anything except build confidence. On well, the way, you know, 
uh, Brad and Larson was lapping everybody, just the fact that he was able to stay up towards the front to even get in those positions starting that far back is really impressive Um, because there wasn't, you know, that many cars like wrecked out. So it wasn't like a Talladega type finish or anything like what we would have seen, you know, two weeks ago. Uh, He earned this 22nd place finish. And for DraftKings, that's plus 16 on the PD scale. That that works out. Yeah, no, that's a big uh, big uh, asset to have whenever it's basically a free bingo uh, bingo spot on the, on your your board. So uh, I took it a lot last week, and it helped me um, in in most of my situations break even. And this is one of those things where you look at it uh, week to week, who offers you the uh, best opportunity to reach value. And I I saw him as one of those key building blocks, and it it paid off. Yeah, I think you know really overall uh, kind of solid week for us when our projections and everything uh i think mostly it just ha- came down to the the combos we we had all decent lineups they were all kind of close just being off a little bit um you know we weren't we weren't high on guys like amarola and he i don't know what is going on with that team i know we don't talk about him too much but starting 18th and then finishing 29th two DraftKings points yeah it, two it was it's, it's not been a pretty season from the NASCAR perspective either he started really horribly and bit had some uh, unfortunate situations arise early in the season that uh, weren't necessarily all his fault but then he's had some races where he hasn't been uh, performing well and he had a couple race stretch where he put together a couple uh, solid races but uh, here we are again 28th it's one of those situations where if you look at it from an owner's perspective there's a lot of drivers that would love to be driving this equipment and that have uh, less equipment right now that, that are putting up salt, way better finishes than he is. So something that you want to kind of maybe keep an eye on, I don't think anybody does a midseason change, but holy smokes, it's not been pretty. Well, the fact that he kind of brings in a lot of his own funding helps. Absolutely. Um, but and it, he, I, I, it must there must be something going on deeper in the teams because I uh, Stuart Haas is obviously off this year compared to where they were last year but Harvick did finish second and he kind of was up towards the front most of this race in Kansas so they're making improvements Amarola had some bad races last year no doubt but nothing like what we've seen this year I think even despite that funding he's got to do so he may be completely out of the playoff picture at this point without a win maybe he can save that seat if he can get you know in the top 20 or something like that in points but it's that 10 team right now is it's not looking great for them yeah and to be fair we've had a lot of 750 horsepower package races we're going into a stretch now where you've got some 550s and some road courses and stuff. He's not really been the greatest road course driver, but he's manageable. Uh, so maybe he can sneak in and get some strong finishes there, and maybe they've been catering to those couple packages, and they can uh, strategize to kind of get some uh, decent finishes and maybe a win in there. So I'm not writing him on completely off. He's a great driver. He's a professional for a reason. He's in the top echelon of the sport for a reason. He's a solid driver. Uh, it's just kind of concerning to see the – finishes that we have with all the data we have at this point in the season well and i know this is going to sound like i'm i'm picking on him but I'm, this is a compliment to him and his team but he's getting outperformed by michael mcdowell going into the season you wouldn't have ranked michael mcdowell and that team higher than the 10 team and and i think mcdowell for, you know this week and in the past weeks he's had some rough spots from a DraftKings perspective uh, but he's actually done really well still. I thought he, after those first couple of weeks of strong runs, I was like, okay, now they're going to start kind of phasing out. And they kind of did a little bit, but they're still hanging around. Uh, I don't think they're you know, a threat for a deep, deep playoff run, but they could sneak in and get a pass that next round and upset some really talented drivers that will also be in the playoffs. It wouldn't be surprising. I think uh, we could see some stuff out of Michael McNall, not not this week, but in the weeks to come that are going to potentially surprise a lot of people. I'm hoping that we can capitalize on that value 
on a DraftKings angle in the weeks to come because he's been great in the 550 horsepower setup, and he's been fantastic on his career in road courses. And we've got a bunch of that coming up. I'm excited to see how DraftKings uh, approaches him and a couple of other drivers that we're going to uh, mention later on in regards to uh, how they get priced. One of the last guys I kind of wanted to touch on, um, for, for, at least for me, in, in uh, Kansas, if there's anyone else you want to talk about, uh, feel free. But I wanted to give a shout-out to uh, the 21 team, uh, Matty D. Another solid finish, really solid. Started fifth, finished fourth, uh, had over 5x value, 41 points. That's That's good. Not... Uh, amazingly good for the lineup but that's that's impressive for that team much like Amarola he had a terrible start to the season he's back in the playoffs now I think he's 16th um so obviously he's not locked in by any means but that team is starting to come on I think he's got some good tracks coming up they're clicking now I think Matty D's kind of back in this and I was worried after about week three and I like where you how you described where he was at and how he's kind of gotten to, and picked up uh whenever he was in the slump him and Almarola were in the slump together and we can see what Matty D's been able to do versus where Almarola is at it's a testament to the the will and the power that he has and I guess just the sheer must want to win um attitude that he's always driven with so not surprising, but it's awesome to see how far they've actually been able to come out of uh, out of that hole. Obviously, the announcement already is this will be his last year in the 21. Austin Cendrick, who we mentioned earlier, is taking that over. At least that's the announcement. I don't know if there will be any sort of changes, but, man, I really hope he's able to find – I know he can find another ride, but I hope he can find another top top quality ride, maybe even a step up. Because he's shown, you know, he's got it. When you give him a good car, doesn't he have to be great? A good car, he's. I mean, he was up front, almost won Talladega, and then right up front here. I mean, these are completely different tracks. Not the best road course racer, but not bad either. He's a solid driver that deserves, at least in my opinion, a good top tier equipment. Although, who knows what's going to happen next year with the next gen car and how. If it's going to be more parity, we don't know any of that yet. So, uh, but still, that's kind of my point of view on, on Matt. It's like I, I really hope he can get something. Yeah, and to your point, the next gen car was announced this week, and that's something that was a lot of had a lot of us NASCAR fans excited to kind of oh yeah s- kind of s- see the unveiling officially. I know we've all seen kind of prototypes and the uh, pictures of uh, all the bodies without the paint jobs and everything, and maybe even a couple. Pictures of with yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. you know, <laughs> it was cool to see it all unveiled finally and have a couple of the drivers from each uh, each uh, uh, maker. Toyota had Denny Hamlin, um, Chevy had uh, Chase Elliott, and then Ford had Joey Logano. And it was cool to kind of see them unveil the uh, the new next gen car. There's a lot of new uh, new features and uh, specs and all the mumbo jumbo associated with uh, what's under the hood. But it's a completely different shakeup uh, from what we're traditionally used to seeing, and it's going to be chaotic, and it's going to be interesting to go year one in 2022. Yep. Uh, I'm I'm still happy where we're at with this year because there's a lot of races left to go. I can't wait to see how it plays out. But I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm really excited for next year, what these cars are going to do, if we can see more parity um, with, NASCAR being supplied the cars and basically assembling them is my understanding, at least at this point. So we maybe we will see some of these lower end teams uh, finally have a shot. I mean, that night they had a pro invitational race with the next gen spec cars. And even though he had like no front end and had wrecked basically the entire field, Anthony Alfredo finished second behind eric jones yeah two Which, guys but that, that's not two that's, guys that don't have the upper echelon of right. equipment yeah but eric jones is really good at darlington I'm and we're going to talk about him here in a little understand. bit um to me that wasn't surprising 
But also to your point, yes. But we've seen him in top tier equipment, and we've seen Absolutely. him win. Absolutely. But we didn't see Alfredo do this, and we and and then not just him, but other guys too were up there that we wouldn't normally see in a normal NASCAR race. If we can get something a little closer to that next year, that's going to be really exciting. I mean, that's that's going to open up everybody to be potentially playable next year, which will be challenging, but also a lot of fun. And the racing should be, in, in that case, really good too. Yeah, I'm super excited to see what next year holds, but we've got a race this week. Yep. We've got a fun one and a very historical track for NASCAR. Iconic. Iconic track for sure. And we're doing something or NASCAR's doing something a little bit different this this year. Uh typically we do the throw or they do the throwback uh paint schemes for the Southern five hundred and now we're doing it this this uh this time around for the four hundred. It's gonna be a little bit of a change of pace, but it'll be fun. We'll have the uh, the Southern five hundred the first race in the playoffs. So that'll be awesome, uh, to open that experience. So this and, and, and normally we only get one Darlington race right. a year. We got spoiled last year with three. Three, yes. Uh because of COVID and having to make up all those races, the the long break off. Makes sense. It's really close to where NASCAR is headquarters, so Completely understand why they would do that and that they were allowed to do it. So I com- completely get that. Uh, but we get two this year. Uh, so that's that's a little new. That's exciting. Uh, there's a lot of good drivers here. Or, or, the, or there are a lot of drivers who are good here. A lot of options. Um, so this is the shorter one. And I kind of like Darlington when it's a little bit shorter. And let's not forget about the horsepower setup difference too. Uh, traditionally, this is a uh, 550 horsepower package. The last couple times they, or a few times they've ran here, and this time around, it's a 750 horsepower package. So I think tire strategy um, and tire wear and the strategy associated with that's really going to be impactful. Well, yeah, I mean you're gonna instead of kind of coasting into the corners, they're going to be braking. Um, it won't be like a road course, but it's going to be similar as you're going to have to hit your braking zones consistently to be able to get around this track quickly. Um, and we know who's good at tracks like that. Um, and we'll talk about them, but we mentioned it is 400 miles. So at this track, that's 293 laps. This track is uh, 1.366 miles long. Uh, with that uh, 293 laps, there are 205.1 per, uh, potential performance points. So you got to have some dominators if you're going to be winning any kind of money. Yeah, so those performance points are given away to fastest laps and laps led. Uh, those are really key metrics uh, when you're looking at it from a DraftKings angle. Absolutely. And then uh, the stages are, the first stage is 90, second stage is 95, and then the last last stage is 108 laps. With a competition caution, I believe I saw at lap 30. Uh, that first stage is gonna be wild there's gonna be a lot of good action pack racing in those first 30 laps and we're trying to fill out their car of course come in for the right setups and then it's gonna be a grind uh we'll see some cautions i'm sure uh, but i think we'll also see some nice long green flag runs as well yeah and we'll see hopefully some really good action on the restarts uh rubbin's racing here that's hopefully we'll see uh some some action on that uh, that front too i think it's going to be really exciting there's a lot of good information available to us, like you said, regarding the, the package that they're running, um, especially this year. Uh, we've got a lot of race data made available to us because we've gotten a little bit further into the season. We're more than a quarter way in already. So there's a lot of stuff that's really starting. We're, we're starting to get a really good feel for it. Um, and Darlington's just one of those those racetracks that I I know you've talked about some of your favorite racetracks and how how they uh, affect you and this this is one for me that I remember just growing up really liking Darlington. I, it was one that I would like to play on the on the N64 because it was oddly shaped and you had the grooves that you could uh, run a little bit better than others. Tough, yeah. and, and it was a lot of fun. So I always remembered wanting to race Jeff Gordon and and Dale Earnhardt and just having that experience and then seeing the paint schemes that they're throwing back this week is awesome it's just really cool and then front right here we've got jimmy johnson's uh throwback to uh richard petty and that was to me one of the coolest well it's a hybrid it is a hybrid it's a hybrid between richard petty 
And Dale Earnhardt. And Dale Earnhardt. And th- those seven-time champions, along with Jimmy Johnson, yeah, that it just doesn't get any better than that. So, is there a have you seen very many paint jobs this this week uh, that stood out? One that stood out more than the others to you? Ooh, uh, there's a lot that I I like. Oh, man, I don't know. That's that's tough. I'd almost have to have it kind of in front of me and really go over it because um, there's. You know, you see so many across the truck series and Xfinity, and it's just a cool weekend. It's just, it's just cool. Um, I like that there's three different drivers, and uh, I believe they're all three in Cup doing an Alan Colwicky throwback. Obviously, uh, Chase will have the Hooters throwback. That's a sharp looking car. I think, um, you know, a lot of people I, I, they'll know during the race because I know the announcers are going to talk about it. Jo- Mike Joy and Jeff Gordon, and whatnot, but uh. Um, Alex Bowman is running a throwback to his crew chief, Greg Ives, uh, race car. Um, I think it's a late, late model car oh, that he raced. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they surprised him. They did a video a couple of weeks ago, um, surprising him with ally and everything. And, uh, you could see kind of, you know, kind of choked him up just a little bit. Greg Ives, that is, uh, kind of seeing that cause he wasn't expecting it. I mean, uh, I don't know. I think that's just obviously cool for them and just a cool thing for the team. I mean, that team is – they're doing something right because when it comes to pit stops, they're one of – they are the best four-tire uh, pit crew. So they're they're working good together, and they have a win already this year. So they have had success, but they've had a little up-and-down season. But I think with that chemistry that they have, um, I think that's – only going to help them as the season progresses so i think that i mean it may not be the coolest paint scheme but i think kind of the reason behind why they're doing it that's one that has kind of stood out to me god like how you put everything together about the season and everything how this is really a team sport rather people realize it or not it takes a bunch of people to be successful in this sport it's more than just the driver turning left no matter what you see on tv too absolutely it's a it's a full team effort day in and day out to to get to the racetrack to perform and to even be able to turn a lap it's just insane to think about when you have to understand the full extent of what these guys go through so i like how you you put everything together it's going to be fun. These... How, how about you, though? Oh, uh, man. What's, what a paint. Uh... There, there's so many this week. Again, I'd be like you. I can go through and I could make a choice for any of them. I'm not going to pick one because, again, this to me is about the entire experience. It really is to me. I, I, I do like one or two from the historic point of view, uh, but I, I'm like. I like the history of a lot of things, so I'm not going to just pick one because there's so much history regarding all of them for the most part. It's hard for me to just choose one. And this week, from a DraftKings angle, we see and basically understand why Kyle Larson, again, is at the top of the salary board. Yes, he... You, yes, he is. There's, is there really a reason to explain why? Because how dominant he was last week and all that fun stuff. But it, even and with just the season, kind of overall, even with that, he start he finished thirteenth last week. That's that's the mind blowing thing. Nineteenth, nineteenth. I mean, yeah. so that's the mind blowing thing about this. We get him with potential value starting at fourteenth yeah, yeah. this week. Yeah, very interesting. But that's also part of the reason he's so expensive. That's a part of it and that's what most people are going to see i'm sure if you do your due diligence others will see this but obviously carl larson didn't race any of the races last year so if you look at his last two races at darlington he has an average start of two and a half and he has an average finish of two and a half he has two top fives so 100 percent there average fast lap 57 and a half and an average laps led of 164. Now, one race of those did have, <clears throat> I think it was 284 laps, something like that. That was in a 500 mile, of course, so there were more laps then. But still, average running position of 2.9. Driver rating is 133.4. We don't normally see stats quite like that. Oh, and if we back it up even more, it's still incredibly impressive and he's not 
he was in Hendrick equipment back then. He was in Chip Ganassi, which was maybe even a little more off than what they've been even here in the last couple years, potentially. I mean, that, that I kind of forgot how dominant he was here. Yeah, he's, with three races last year, you kind of forget about it. I was putting together our DK insights and our race guide. By the way, the race guide link is down below in the description. Um, if you want to check it out, it's great to kind of pair with what we're getting ready to dive into. Uh, visual aspects of data and points and things that uh, really can get jumbled up, but we try to do a jo- good job of making it nice and easy to read. So if you want to check it out, it's down below in the description. But in the insights portion of that, I was putting together um, the most laps led and out of a five race segment, he's the mo- has led the most laps and he was only in two races. So to your point, he's been extremely dominant in those two races in that time frame. So nobody else in five races was able to even get close to him, his uh, two race span that he had there. And I think I, if I remember correctly, when you looked at like his his personal previous like four or five races here i think the lowest laps led amount that he had was like 44 or 45 i mean that's the lowest and he had a, i think two or three of those were over 100 it's insane. i mean it's- that's great and then now you give him for sure better handling car than what he had it means he should have a little bit more control running up towards the wall we know he's gonna do that him and reddick uh who i think will also have a potentially good race too uh but and then you give him a 750 horsepower car now he hasn't been as good statistically on 750s compared to the 550s so that may factor in only obviously we'll see when the race comes but you gotta think you get all that extra power, which is what he had in, I think the race that he had 284 laps, I think was a 750 horsepower. Given that much power, better handling car, he and starting 14th from a DraftKings perspective, I think it's it's a as close to a lock as you can get. I think it's the first time we've uh, given somebody tens across the board in our impact, and that's pretty uh, pretty crazy. Spoiler alert! Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Um, the next guy that we could talk about, I guess, is uh, the guy that falls on the salary board next, Joey Logano. Uh, he's starting twelfth. He's somebody that has that place to uh, place differential path as well, and somebody that's been fairly uh, strong this season. Um, going through the data and stuff, I wasn't super impressed by the stats that I saw. Uh, uh, it's kind of not concerning. It just wasn't as good as I would as anticipating with the skill of Joey Logano. Definitely not overly impressive. He was the eighth best driver in the races last year, um, according to driver rating. He had an average finish of ninth, uh, one top five two top tens so not not terrible obviously um but for some someone this week if you're playing them in DraftKings with that price tag that wouldn't really cut it but the thing is team Penske they recognize okay you know you got Martinsville and then Phoenix the last two races of the year you gotta be if you're not already locked in by Martinsville you might need to win that or at least run really well and then obviously the championship race being Phoenix. Those are both 750 horsepower packaged cars for those races. Penske has put a lot of focus last year and this year in those cars because they think that they're going to be good enough to at least get into that last round. And guess what? They were good enough to get in that last round, and both Joey Logano and Brad were in the championship last year. So this year so far, through different analytics, Joey Logano has performed the best in 750 horsepower packages. Denny Hamlin is very close to him. We'll talk about him in just a second. So you got to like Logano this week. There's a lot there. There's enough decent history here at Darlington where you can say, okay, yeah, you can play him. But I do feel like it's a little risky, especially if Kyle Larson pops off similar to how he did last week. Yeah, he's somebody that you definitely don't want to 
overlook uh, you want to have some exposure to but at the price point and just some of the stuff or some of the data uh here i i just don't think he's as good of a value as larson but starting 12th again he could pay dividends so it's not a a, a fate i've given him an impact score of eight because i think he's somebody that really could have an impact on this race um but well, i think larson with that price tag where he's fit in i i think that's an awesome gpp play because he should go way on their own because I don't think a lot of people are going to realize that he's one of the best, maybe statistically the best 750 horsepower so far this year. So it's, in my opinion, I think it's the cash versus a GPP play. If you, if you are going to in a cash environment, play Kyle Larson, it's my strong opinion. And in a GPP scenario where you're playing in a big tournament and you don't have a lot of entries, maybe you have a lot of entries. But if you want to take a couple stabs at it, I think you do that with Logano this week. I think it, it offers a, a great uh, great way to be different. All right. I really want to play Larson 100%. But these guys, Logano, Hamlin, Truex, Brad, Kyle, Harvick, all these guys we're about to talk about, they, they all have – good history here and they've had good runs this year it's DraftKings made it very difficult on how you're going to construct your lineups and be able to construct your lineups this week um because Denny Hamlin we talked you mentioned it early just been Mr. Consistent for the most part you take away Talladega whatnot he's been the one of the best drivers at both 750 and 550 uh but for some reason this week, I, f- I don't like him as much as I probably should. I mean, obviously, I'm going to play him. Um, and he won one of the races last year. I, I don't know. I mean, you think I'm kind of crazy with being hesitant on Hamlin? I mean, I, I know. is this where he pops off? I, I don't know if this is a, a race where he gets out when there's so many other drivers, I think, that might have a leg up on him experience-wise here. Uh, and he's looking at some of his stats. Uh, he does have a recent win here. He does have uh, quite a few top tens, and um, he's got three top tens in the last four races in the span of 2016 to 2019 when they ran a similar package. Um, so, but he averaged finish like 11th. So it's very difficult to kind of put your finger on him. And he, even though he has been that model of consistency this year. I'm just not as high on him this week, um, but he's somebody that I still think has a way to impact the race. Don't want to completely fade him. I'm I'm going to have exposure. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you look at his last five races here. His average starts seven point six, so he's starting seventh this week. So basically, right there, an average finishes eleven point six. So he's losing an average of four spots, but he does have a win and two top fives and maybe this is where we're both kind of seeing it and and a little hesitant in those five races his average fastest laps 12.6 average laps led 8.4 even though he has a win and he's good here that's not that good compared to some of these other guys around him i think for that price tag, you want a dominator, and he has had the ability to do so this year. So I'm saying there's a chance, but I don't like the chances as much. Even though he does have three career wins here, it's no slouch. He, him and um, Harvick are the uh, two with three wins. It's just just it's that price tag and where he's at, and I just don't know if this is the week that he pay, pays off the path or has the path to value that uh, some of these other guys have. It will be interesting with Hamlin. He may stink up the show. Um, but, yeah, my kind of gut and obviously kind of what the data we just talked about, it makes me just a little bit more hesitant on Hamlin. Um, but a guy I'm not hesitant on is uh, Martin Truex Jr., who's starting fourth. And in DraftKings, he's uh, 10300 bucks. He's been really solid here. And... I think he's probably my second favorite play of the top guys behind Larson. How, how are you feeling about Truex this week? I, I agree with you. I think he's somebody that has found a way to get the job done multiple ways this year. Um, 
he's been in that Gibbs stable that has multiple wins now. Denny Hamlin is the only one that we mentioned earlier that doesn't. I think he can find a way to win this week with his uh, starting position if he's able to hold on to that. And if he's able to get a handful of uh, laps led and some fastest laps, which he's more capable of uh, getting done starting fourth, I think he has a path to value. um, And I think he's somebody that might go a little bit overlooked. So I think he's somebody that I'm – got a really strong feeling for this week that might uh, just go ahead and get the job done for us. So what I'm seeing with Truex here in the last five, his average finish is a little worse than Hamlin, 12.8, zero wins, and he has zero top fives. That is troubling. And he only has two top tens out of those five races. Also troubling. But he's averaging 31.8, almost 32 fastest laps. And he's averaging 48.4 laps led. He's a guy who's kind of like Larson. Like if he finds a way to get up front at least some point in the race and holds it. But also kind of like Larson, uh, for some reason not getting these wins here. I don't know if Truex gets that win. I don't know. I don't know if he gets a third win here. I don't really know who's going to end up winning this race. There's so many good good drivers here but i think truex is going to be has a really good shot to be that second dominator that you need maybe pairing with larson and then potentially the winner coming from maybe one of those other guys maybe they don't dominate or maybe a guy a little cheaper like a kyle bush getting back to back or maybe harvick finally getting that win won here twice last year uh that's kind of how i'm viewing truex don't know if he's going to get out front i I don't know if he's going to win, but I think he can get out front and also be fast, and that's why you're probably going to need him in your lineup. Yeah, I completely understand where you're coming from, but the it's just going to be interesting to see if, if he's able to capitalize because I think he does have everything uh, to put it all together finally. We can hopefully see a dominating performance. Only time will tell. Uh, Brad Kozlowski starting first again. Uh, it's somebody that uh, we really probably should talk about because he has been able to dominate at times. Um, but again, is this another scenario where he's able to lead a handful of laps and then Kyle Larson catches him and then or true X or true X or whoever. And it's just not the day because you really need somebody that's starting on the pole to stay up front the entire race. You need them to, especially with this price tag, lead some laps and have some fastest laps. We've seen him be able to do that. He was the optimal last week in this position. Do you think he's able to do it again? We don't see too many drivers make the optimal lineup in DraftKings from the, even the front row, first or second position. It's just so tough. I mean, if he gets back, that he can lead the first 30 laps to the comp caution. Maybe he gets out front and pit stops and can get and lead a few more maybe he doesn't if he leads 30 laps that's still really good but you would still really need him to finish in the top five to be worth the price you got to pay for him and i think he can do it and i think he's a nice pivot from some of these guys we've already talked about but i do have a little hesitations playing brad when i feel like there's so many other strong guys up there but I kind of had the same feeling last week, and he, like you said, he made the optimum. He paid out. Uh, he did fade back, but he was able to race his way back up. Some pit strategy, got fresher tires, blah, 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 whatever. That's what that team does. Sometimes it works out for you. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I'm kind of – I mean, I, 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 I'm, I like Brad this week, and I will have some – there's no way you can fade him, but definitely in a tougher spot for me. Yeah, and I think this week where strategies – can be an impact strategy can also be a detriment and we've seen it bite him before could be uh, a race where he's starting on the pole tries to get a little bit uh, funky with it with strategy and it just might bite him and it could hurt his finishing position i don't say that's necessarily the case but we've seen it before well and the thing and, and we'll obviously talk more about this when we get in our rundown a video so make sure you guys uh, check that out too with where he's priced at there's there's not a lot of good drivers in the cheaper range this week that we like, that we really spotted. And to make him work, and you got to find, I just, I don't think you can cram three 
10 K plus guys in lineups this week and make it work down on the bottom. I think you're going to have to build a little bit more balanced lineup. And I just, I I find like you kind of said earlier, the path to value for Brad is I feel like just a little tougher, even though he's starting on the front and he has the best opportunity to lead laps early. Yeah. And I think the guy next in line, Kyle Bush, 9,800 starting third is almost a similar story. It's going to be very hard for him to, to reach value, but there is a path. He has to do just kind of like we just just got done talking about with Brad, get out front and lead some laps and, and establish himself as a, a dominant threat. And he could do that here. He's not, uh, not horrible by any means, but, uh, I think, Based on my opinion, the guy below him, Kevin Harvick, would be the better play. A lot of people might think that too. So I think Kyle Busch would be a great GPP play. Great GPP play. Um, he has two top fives in the last five races, and he has four top tens. Uh, average finish is uh, ninth. Not not terrible. Mm-hmm. Starting third, that's a little bit more. Uh, but I could see him, you know, staying up towards the front. Finishing third, fourth, fifth, maybe sixth, seventh, somewhere around in there, having another solid day. I don't know if he's going to get out front and lead, and you got to have him lead laps in this position. But coming off the win, that makes it, in my opinion, more difficult because it's like, okay, well, now they maybe they got a little momentum going. Uh, we know he doesn't like the 550 package. So now that they got the 750 this week, maybe he's able to do a little bit more with it. Maybe they don't come with the right setup. Maybe he comes with another killed car. I don't know. Uh, but, I, again, I kind of like Kyle Busch this week. I th- I, I'm going to be playing him some. I'm going to find ways to get him in there at least a little bit, even though I think you're right. I think Kevin Harvick is, at least statistically-wise, much better play here than Kyle Busch would be. Yeah, and he's starting second, which puts him on the front row, and there's a good possibility that they – this is one of, I think, his favorite tracks, so it's going to be interesting to see. He's got three wins here. He's Like you said, it's statistically, it's he really pops here. Um, And starting second allows him a lot easier path to clean air and cars behind him than even starting third with Kyle Busch I think it just seems to be maybe the race that Kevin Harvick can kind of snap out of his his cold spell. We won two out of the three races here last year. I think he finished second in the other one, or behind Hamlin, wasn't it? I think so, or because his average finish is one point seven, so maybe finished third. Whatever. He has three top fives last year at this track. Really good, averaging 67 laps led and almost 35 fastest laps. Average running position, 5.9. He's been really solid. He's the highest guy as far as driver rating last year, 125. Just solid, but like we've talked about many times this year already, they are a little off. They're not quite where they were last year, but similar to how we were talking about last week with Kyle Busch. We kind of felt it coming. We knew it was coming at some point. I kind of figured that Harvick would actually get a win before Kyle Busch just based on what we saw last year. But we know that they're getting better. We can see it in the stats. They're making improvements. Um, The team's starting to work together more. They're getting their bugs out. Whatever it is, they're close. And to me, this would be, you know, outside of a track maybe like Atlanta or, or whatever, a few other tracks that Harvick's been really good at, this is been a really good track for him i think that's why i say i think he's a little bit better play than kyle bush yeah i think he really stood out to both of us as we were looking at our 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 data points and really preparing for this this week and somebody i feel is a strong play and i know that you do too so somebody i uh i'm looking potentially uh to use as a building block in the cash game uh the next guy is very interesting Again, in a very nice spot to reach value. Alex Bowman starting 19th. Uh, He didn't have as great of a finish as we were hoping for last week. And it just seems like he's next or every other race kind of guy. Um, 
is this his weekend, do you think? There's some, a lot of data I know from last year that really looked good uh, from the three-race stint that we did or that uh, we went through last year that he looked solid. So is that something we can expect this week or are you expecting what, – what, what are you expecting this week, I guess? Well, to me, and I don't have this data to back me up, but just what my eyes tell me, it seems like Bowman has been better this year on the 750 package compared to the 550s. Seems like he's just been a little faster, a little stronger. But the stats that I'm about to talk about were obviously from last year's Darlington race in the 550 package. So saying all that, he was the third best driver, according to driver rating, right behind Truex. Um, less than a one-point difference between him and Truex. He had an average finish of 8.7, one top five, two top tens. He's averaged fastest laps. Here's the thing. Fastest laps, 23.7, and average laps led was 14 amongst those three races. Solid. That was surprising. I didn't realize that he had that strong of a finish consistently last year at Darlington. So starting 19th, he's got that PD upside. I think he can be fast again. And if he can just stay out of trouble, kind of typical – um, thing we could say about Bowman, I think he could be one of those guys that is fighting up there in the top five, maybe putting that 48 back out front in Darlington for that throwback race. And uh, also in that paint scheme we were just talking about earlier. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm overthinking it just a little bit, but I, I think Bowman's in just a, a great spot this week. And there's not a ton of really good place differential plays. So I think that, that Bowman might be one of the better ones. Yeah, he's a little bit more pricey than some of the other guys. Uh, but I I agree with you. I think he's somebody that you have to pay attention to. He's got the stats. He's been fast this year. We've seen what his teammate in Larson's done. We've already talked about two Hendrick cars. Now we get to talk about a third. Chase Elliott um, is now $9,200. Starting sixth, he could really find a way to fit into a lot of lineups based on his price tag. But some of the data I wasn't too enthused about. But again, I think there's a lot of stuff that I do like about Chase and how they are potentially starting to step it up at the right time, um, headed into a stretch what we know. He likes the road courses and all that. This week could be a nice way to get this portion of the season boosted with a win. Yeah, if you look at the numbers, not that doesn't look great for Chase, but really, to me, the story with him is Rex. The, I mean, case in point, last year, he had the right pit strategy late in the race. He had fresher tires. He was racing his way up to the front, and it, I think Hamlin was first. He had just passed Kyle Busch, going to second, and Kyle Busch tried to slid in behind him. It was real. There wasn't hardly enough room. He clipped the rear end, dumped Chase, wrecked him, finished last, like 40th. So that's going to skew the numbers. He did have a race last year uh, in the top five that he finished at. But here's the thing that stood out to me. 20 fastest laps, not great, but okay, he can get around the track, cool. Uh, 47.3 average laps led. So if he can get out front, which we haven't seen other than the road course this year, we haven't really seen Chase do Chase-like things, but we mentioned it last week. Uh, it seems like the team is kind of, they they didn't get off to a fast start last year, and then they, they've really started peaking. I think we're kind of getting there with this nine team. And this could be a really good spot for him, too, in that special paint scheme. Uh, I mean, I am a little torn about Chase just based on what we've seen. Uh, but, I mean, uh, he's – I mean, impact-wise, I gave him an eight. I think he's a strong play, and he has a lot of – I think he has a really high ceiling, like, potential. And I, I don't think – I say this. I mean, he did get dumped, but – I think he can survive the wrecks, and I think he can maintain at least a solid finish. I think he's a fairly safe place, safer than his numbers indicate, in my opinion. Yeah, he's he's going to be an interesting guy to try to fit into your lineups, but I 
definitely want exposure to Chase. I think this could be a race where he could really pop and could go a little overlooked because the guy right next to him, his best friend on the slate, Ryan Blaney, 9,000 starting 16th. I think we differ more here on him than I think we have all season. Uh, yeah. I know the data and everything. I completely understand where you're coming from uh, by give him you gave him a five on your impact. I gave him an eight. So we're really far apart on him. But the reason I think there is a great a way he can impact this race is he's starting 16th and he's in Penske equipment. And even though he doesn't have the greatest numbers here this year, we've already seen him kind of take a, another step as a driver and mature a little bit more and not find himself in a lot of situations that he has found himself in the past. And here at Darlington, maybe it's not his favorite racetrack. Maybe uh, he hasn't had the greatest success, but I think he takes that next step again at this track and is able to manage a top 10 finish potentially and pay off that price tag because there's not a lot of great place differential plays this week, like you mentioned earlier. And I think he could be one of the key ones to take that step to unlock a lot of stuff to uh, really get some of those guys that have the chance to be dominant. I hear what you're saying, um, but I, I disagree. It wouldn't shock. It w I wouldn't be that shocked if he does what you said, gets in the top 10 um, and has some decent value. And heck, like I said, Penske has been focusing on these types of, you know, this powertrain, the 750 package, so maybe he can have a fast car and get around there. But to me, if you just look at the last five races here for him, his average finish is 17.8, zero top 10s, two top 15s. Okay, all right, whatever. Um, but he's the 16th ranked driver in driver rating here in the last five, 75.8. That's not very good. His average PD is minus 7.8. Okay, sure. Took that into consideration. But then I was like, okay, let me add just a little bit more similar track history. So I also included Dover. So this is from 2019 and 2020, all the races. So there's eight total, four for each of them. Um, he has zero top tens in those eight races. So you think he can get a top 10, and I know talent-wise he can in most tracks, but the fact that he hasn't done an eight is troubling to me, and his average finish amongst those eight races is 18.8. .8. Uh, there's just some tracks that Blaney just seems to struggle at and others that he really excels. Uh, so for me, I'll find a way to build a few because I recognize the talent, I recognize the team's talent, uh, his crew chief, Todd Gordon, he's a champion with when he was with Joey Logano. So I know that everything is in place for him to have success here. I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, but there's always a first time for everything. Yeah, and my viewpoint is primarily that they're running the 750 horsepower package here, and I think that skews some of the data, and I think this becomes more of a race a wild card race than what most people anticipate. And I think that he finds a great path to value and is one of the only ways that you can unlock some of that. But that's my opinion. You, you've got yours. You explained yours very well, and you've got a lot of data to back it up to. So I completely understand. There's a lot of guys below that uh, we could talk about. I don't think we spend a lot of time talking about. I think one in, in particular really stands out this week. Um, Eric Jones at eighty-two hundred dollars, uh, starting twenty-sixth. We saw him um, in the uh, Invitational get that uh, I racing win. That was pretty cool. Um, but he is really good here at Darlington. He's got a this, lot of stats that really pop off. This is probably his best track. Uh, I know he's been really good at super speedways, um, but they we're not at a super speedway. We're at Darlington, and in the last five races, he has a win. And he has three top fives and an average finish of 5.2. Okay. He's in Gibbs equipment. He's not, or he was in Gibbs equipment, I should say. He's not anymore. But as the fourth best driver rated driver in the last five here at a 106.3 and an average PD of 11.8, 
the fact that he's starting uh, 26th and it's his best track and he won the Pro Invitational, which the last time that happened was a couple weeks ago. Brad won Talladega and won the real Talladega uh, on a slate that we don't have a lot of great PD position drivers. I think Eric Jones is probably the best PD upside that you can get, even though he's $8,200, a little expensive for the equipment that he's in. Um, but if he's able to keep it clean, I think a top 10 is entirely possible. If he does that, he's hitting probably 6X or more. Yeah, he's a play that I think uh, you really need to have uh, for value this week. There's a lot of guys up in the upper tier that you really want to have exposure to. So finding guys in the middle of the pack uh, is going to be challenging this week. But we'll uh, help you in the race day rundown, which goes uh, live on the morning of race day. Another quick compact video to help uh, uh, you dial in your race day lineup and get uh, get exposure to some of these other smaller or drivers that we didn't get a chance to touch on uh, in this uh, this uh, podcast episode. Yeah, absolutely. That's gonna. There's some. I mean, like you said, there's not a lot of a lot of guys down here that you that we like, but there's a few, and we'll tell you about them in the rundown. Um, but now I think. I think now we need to tell them about why these are here. Yeah, it's uh, something we're excited to announce. We are actually going to be uh, at CODA, the road course in Austin, Texas. We're going to be doing broadcasts from uh, from there. And for some fun and entertainment, we are we bought a couple boxes of 2021 Don Russ Racing. And we want to give hobby hobby these are boxes hobby boxes yeah so these are the the good ones uh but no in all all reality we're excited to try to engage with y'all as much as possible from that event so to help do that we're going to be giving away one if not both of these boxes so to do this what we would like to do is have you go to the description below and click on the link for the specific tweet for for the giveaway and we'll describe all the details in the video all you have to do is like and retweet and tag three of your friends to be entered to win that obviously we want to give both of these away so to do that if we can get to 200 subscribers here on youtube we'll be giving away both of them if we don't get there guess what we get to open one live at coda and we will be giving away the second one for sure no matter how many uh subscribers we get we just want to be able to stay engaged with you and continue to find ways to to i guess nurture this because we're having a lot of fun and we want to bring you along for the ride yeah and don these are really cool uh in the past i haven't always been the biggest fan of the uh, don rust look but they really nailed it these last couple years and there's some cool cards in here we got some downtown some like watercolors uh, there's obviously an autograph and two memorabilia in every box, um, and there's a ton of cards in here. There's some really good stuff. You, whoever gets this, you're gonna love opening this. This is this is a great uh, product this year. And we really hope to give both of them away. So we are almost at 100 subscribers. Hopefully, we can get there by this week. But if we're able to double that by coda we'll be giving both of those away if not i guess i don't mind opening one will you oh yeah no we'll open that at coda and we'll have a lot of fun so uh but you know what we'll have fun seeing what you guys get hopefully you'll at least let us know <laughs> yeah so but with all that being said again the link is below please go share that with your friends help spread the word we want to help grow this thing and help you win that's what we're here for to provide you with the information to do so we're decided to give these away uh, we're excited for the engagement that you guys have been giving us. Um, all that being said, man, I think we just take them right into the rundown. Let's do it. All right. All right.